Okay, welcome back. Today we're continuing our Let's Learn ABA series with Token Economies. Token Economies, one of the most frequently used reinforcement systems in ABA, also one of the most misunderstood, frequently implemented incorrectly. Today we're going to go over the right way to do it, the steps you need, and how to make it the most effective. As always, if you're looking for RBT materials, rbtexamreview.com is your source. BCBA materials, bcbastudy.com. We've helped thousands of users pass their exams, so you could be next. Questions, comments, let us know. As always, work hard, study hard. Let's learn ABA token economies. So token economies, frequently done incorrectly. Always used frequently done incorrectly. So we're going to go over how we can do them correctly. Remember, RBTs and BCBAs both need to know these things. Proven effective and practically every setting and context, classrooms, clinics, homes, residential facilities, the list goes on and on. They're used because they've been proven effective when done correctly. There are basic steps we need to follow. Identify target behaviors is number one. What are we looking at? Two, select tokens. What are we going to use? Three, develop a menu of backup reinforcers. What are we going to exchange for? Four, establish an exchange ratio. Five, determine the reinforcement schedule for earning the tokens. And then six, try out the system. These are our basic steps. So let's go through each one by one. First, target behaviors. As always, when choosing skill acquisition plans or behavior reduction plans, when designing them, we want to choose our targets first. We build our programs around the target behaviors and skills, not the other way around. So first things first, identify target behaviors. Build the token economy around the target behavior. As always, behaviors should be operationally defined, observable, measurable, and specific, especially if we're going to be using them in token economies. We want the tokens and the exchanges and the reinforcements to happen for a precise behavior. It's the entire idea. Start with a small number so you're not overwhelmed or reinforcing too much. Okay, one or two behaviors is great to start with. And then ideally individualize token economies. Now, understandably, if you've got 20 or 30 kids in a classroom, much more difficult to individualize. You should still try. That should be your number one priority. But if you're doing a one-on-one, -on -one, or even a small clinic setting, there's really no excuse not to individualize all your token economies, especially when coming to target behaviors. Now, I've run group token economies, and we have a set of target behaviors that are what we consider pre-learner skills. Totally fine. And then each kid is approached in a way that is conducive to them obtaining the behaviors, right? Individualize as much as possible. So what should we select first in a token economy? A, potential tokens, B, potential backup reinforcers, C, potential target behaviors, or D, potential punishers. Well, we know it's not potential punishers. We're going to talk about a punishment procedure we can possibly use in token economies, but it won't be first. Tokens and backup reinforcers go hand in hand, but those are going to follow our selection of the target behaviors. Remember, we build around the target behaviors, not the other way around. So then we select our tokens. And tokens, typically in ABA, we think about little printed out laminated picture cards, which are great, totally acceptable. But you can essentially use anything for tokens as long as we're pairing them correctly. You can use pictures. You can use points. You can use tally marks. Fake money is great to, for teaching kids the value of money. There are some guidelines. Tokens should be safe. Always ensure the safety of our clients. That should be an obvious one. Don't use something sharp like a thumbtack, obviously, for a token. Not something that can be easily ingested or swallowed if that is a risk. Okay, Just use common sense when choosing tokens. The instructor or analyst should control the tokens, meaning you should control the distribution, what it looks like, and be aware of if you're going to use something like a tally mark that they can't get bootleg reinforcement, meaning they can't obtain reinforcement when they don't actually engage in the target behavior. So be very smart about how we're going to distribute our tokens. Tokens should be durable because you can carry tokens around. It makes it a great uh, generalized system because you can move them around, but make them durable because ideally you're going to be using them quite a bit. Tokens should be accessible. I've seen it before where we're running a token system and because the tokens are out of reach or out of the room, the kid engages in the target behavior and the 
technician cannot deliver the reinforcer. And that's that's a problem. We want to be consistent. Whatever our reinforcement schedule is, we need to maintain it. Tokens have to be accessible so we can achieve that goal. And then tokens can be individualized. The token itself does not necessarily need to be extremely reinforcing, right? Or extremely preferred. Again, you can use a blank white picture card, but it doesn't hurt to individualize. Research indicates that preferred items used as tokens are actually more beneficial, okay? So that's why we print out specific pictures for specific clients, okay? Again, this just is just a standard rule that you should apply to everything. When you can, when you have the time, the resources and availability, individualize, individualize, individualize. Question, which of the following stimuli could potentially function as tokens? Remember, as long as you're following basic guidelines, safe, durable, accessible, not bootleggable, right? You can choose virtually anything. Could you use poker chips? Sure, poker chips are a type of real real life token, right? If you're playing poker or cards, you exchange the chips for money. Paper clips, sure, maybe you'd say, well, some would say, well, they have a potentially sharp end, right? But you could still use paper clips as a token. I don't, I don't see them as a danger, okay? Now, you could argue that, and I'd be open to hear that argument. See, tally marks, tally marks are very common, all right, especially in group systems. If you have something laminated or printed on the wall and you're making tally marks, very common. So which of the following stimuli could potentially function as tokens? It's going to be D, all the above. You can use virtually anything as a token as long as you compare it and as long as they follow these basic guidelines. Most important thing, be individualistic, be safe. Then we've had our target behaviors. We have our tokens. Now we need to develop backup reinforcers. Tokens don't mean anything without good backup reinforcers. And when we talk about backup reinforcers, we're talking about a menu of backup reinforcers. And this is where people often go wrong, okay? This idea of a menu of backup reinforcers and establishing an exchange. Ideally, you would want three, four, five backup reinforcers of different value for your client to pick, okay? So ensure the stimuli are reinforcing. If the backup reinforcers are not reinforcing, the tokens are not going to be reinforcing. So pick items and stimuli that are actually reinforcing. Activities and, event and events are extremely common to use for backup reinforcers, right? Escape from a task to go play the computer. Going outside for 10 minutes. Eating lunch with friends. Getting on the computer. Playing iPad, right? All these we've done a million times. Activities and events are extremely common. Can you use tangibles? Can you use things like dessert and toys? Sure, right? Essentially, it doesn't matter. It's not a bad idea to conduct a preference assessment because all you're going to do is make a menu and set prices anyway. So it's going to be up to you. And again, this is where individualizing what you're doing with the kid comes into play to set the prices to make it realistic for the child, right? We have um, more luxury backup reinforcers, which might be more expensive. Common backup reinforcers, which might be less expensive, okay? Think about if you go to an arcade and you're exchanging tickets for prizes. Same idea. You want to use the most powerful but least intrusive naturally occurring reinforcer possible. And that's why activities and events are common. These are naturally occurring things that we can use to our advantage. We can really utilize the pre-mac principle here. If you earn five tokens, you can exchange it for access to the arcade or the playground or, 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 right? Naturally, naturally, naturally is, is, is essential because token economies can feel very contrived. So we still want to maintain some level of generalization. Now, how do tokens obtain reinforcing properties? Again, if we're not picking good backup reinforcers, if we're not picking stimuli that possess reinforcing properties, we can't effectively make tokens that are of any value. Because how do tokens obtain those properties? A, tokens are already reinforcing. B, through a preference assessment. C, through pairing. And D, tokens are not reinforcing. Well, D is not true. A, tokens are already reinforcing. Typically, they're not, especially if they've never seen, if the learner has never seen that token before. They don't naturally uh, possess reinforcing properties. Not through the preference assessment. Remember, a preference assessment and a reinforcer assessment are two very different things. Preference assessment simply identifies 
potential reinforcers? What does the client like? So that leaves us with C, through pairing. Through the pairing of our tokens in exchange for our backup reinforcers, which are appropriately priced, we establish tokens as generalized, conditioned reinforcers, making them very valuable to teach many, many things that we want our learners to know. So how do tokens obtain reinforcing properties? C, through pairing. Then we establish a token exchange ratio, meaning how many tokens does it take to earn the ice cream cake? How many tokens does it take to earn access to the iPad? How many tokens does it take to get to play video games for an hour? We have to make these token exchange ratios realistic, but we also have to make them not too high to where you're going to get ratio strain and the client isn't going to work because it's just too difficult to obtain the necessary amount of tokens to earn the backup reinforcer. So you want to start small. My rule of thumb, the token exchange ratio is when we first start and we're on a new system, we'd be very liberal and very uh, accommodating for giving our tokens. Okay. We really want to dole out the tokens quick and we want to exchange those tokens quick. We want to show our learners, if you get these tokens quickly and exchange them quickly, you get the things you want. I really, really establish that exchange, okay, and that economy early and often. As that learner increases their responsiveness, and they're earning tokens more readily, you can adjust the ratio. So what used to cost five tokens might now cost 10. As Earnings increase, increase the value of backup reinforcers. So you could also make more luxury items before you got access, 10 minutes access to the puzzle. Your earnings increase, now I'm going to give you 20 minutes access to Xbox. Don't forget to determine how tokens will be dispensed. You as the instructor, the teacher, the analyst need to be in control of the tokens at all time. How are you going to dispense them? How are you going to store them? Typically in ABA, we make boards and we Velcro the tokens to the board, which are great. It's one way to do it. You can put them in a cup. You can put them in a box. Up to you, okay? Remember, individualize, individualize, individualize. So token exchange ratio, what should be done as token earning behaviors increase? So as the positive behaviors increase, we're earning more tokens, getting more uh, earnings, right? What do we do? A, increase the cost of backup items. Absolutely. If you keep it at five, but they're doubling how often they earn tokens, right? Just not going to be as effective. B, devalue tokens. You can certainly decrease the value of tokens, okay? C, increase the number of backup items. Maybe we add more luxury items. Maybe we add more expensive items. So all of these things are an option if we want um, or, or as token earning behaviors increase. So as we become more successful we need to shift our exchange ratio and adjust the economy and never stay stagnant. So what should be done as token earning behaviors increase? Well, D, all the above. Remember, ask yourself, how will the tokens be exchanged? So we, we, we've established our tokens, our target behaviors, our exchange ratio. How are we going to exchange them? Okay. Typically, you're going to provide a menu and a cost of each backup. You're going to allow the learner to select from the menu what they want. And as you know the learner, okay, you, you don't necessarily need to use the menu every time. They might just prefer one thing, but it doesn't hurt every now and then to remind them what else is available, okay? The token should be physically exchanged, meaning if you're using a token board, have them hand the token board to you, right? If you're using a piggy bank, they need to actually exchange with you. And this is the piece so many people miss. A client will get the five tokens they need or whatever, and they'll just give them the item. The exchange is very important, okay? Make sure you make sure you make sure you're doing the exchange. You may need to start with more frequent exchanges, right? If we need to establish our tokens, which is what we talked about. Maybe every two tokens we start with, and then we gradually move to four and six and eight, okay? All very common sense, right? This doesn't have to be rocket science because it, it's really not. But remember, you, you want to implement these correctly, because I'll often hear, well, I, I try token economies and they don't work. And I say, well, explain to me how you set it up. And 99% and of the time, it's incorrect. But you need to follow these guidelines, which aren't aren't difficult, okay? 
but they are effective. There's so much research on the effectiveness of token economies. So what should be done if the requirements for reinforcement are not met? So let's say they don't meet the requirements. Well, this is up for you to decide. Remember, you always want them to be able to earn the tokens. As soon as they lose the ability to earn tokens and meet the requirements, you start to lose a lot of motivation and you don't want to lose that motivation. So you can remind them of the contingency to earn tokens. If you complete five math problems, you get a token. If you remain in your seat for 10 minutes, you get a token. You can refuse to provide the reinforcer. Sorry, not enough tokens. Keep working hard. And you may need to reevaluate if the learner has the skill to earn the token. Remember, we always choose target behavior first. If they're not successful at earning tokens, we'll reevaluate. Is the ratio too high? Is it too difficult to obtain the tokens? Do they even have the skill in the first place? As the instructor, as the designer, this is on you. This is your responsibility. All right. Notice we're not just automatically jumping to punishment consequences. All right. We're trying to figure out other ways to continue them working to earn these tokens because that's really the entire idea. Earn your tokens, exchange them for your backup reinforcers, start to fade the token economy. So now, response cost. Response cost is the punishment procedure associated with a token economy. Again, extremely common, extremely effective, right? Do you have to have a response cost procedure? You do not. It's up to you, up to the severity, up to you if you think it's going to be effective. So what do we do in a response cost? You're basically removing a token contingent on behavior. A lot of people will give a learner, they'll start them with a bonus token, and that'll be the response cost token. Some will simply just remove tokens already earned, which I try to avoid, but again, it's up to you. It is a type of punishment procedure, so be aware of the ethical violations and guidelines for punishment. Sometimes more effective for a behavior change procedure, meaning if you're trying to teach a skill, punishment isn't necessarily the best the best way to go about it. But if you're trying to change a behavior, punishment can be effective at reducing the behavior. But remember our ethical guidelines. If we're going to use punishment and reduce something, we need to also be using reinforcement, teaching something else. So that doesn't change with response cost just because it's a different type of intervention. So what type of procedure is a response cost intervention? A, positive punishment. B, negative punishment. C, positive reinforcement or negative reinforcement. Well, think about it. We know it's a punishment procedure because we're decreasing a behavior. Are we adding or taking away something? Or taking away a token, removing a token, meaning it's negative. So a response cost is going to be a negative punishment procedure contingent on a behavior during a token economy. Other considerations consider you must train your staff. It's going to be your responsibility as the teacher or the technician to train your staff on the proper use of tokens. Consider the level of the learner when choosing exchange ratios and reinforcement systems. Consider you'll need to eventually withdraw the token economy. Token economies are not naturalistic, right? Understand the older they get and the more natural the environment, you're going to eventually need to withdraw this token economy. So have a plan. And then always, always, always evaluate the token economy on an ongoing basis. Finally, a level system is a type of token economy, not used that often, but something I think should be used more. It's where participants can move up and down a tier system. So maybe you start uh, in the yellow tier, and then as you earn tokens, you move to the blue tier, and then the green tier, and then the white tier, and then the black tier. And as you move up, you get more privileges, access to privileges, access to luxury items. But the reinforcement schedule is much more thin. So remember, the level system is great for fading out. If the reinforcement system at the bottom is FR1, then maybe at the top, we're looking at something like a VR5. Okay, Level system is a great way to fade out your economy. Quick refresher. Don't make it harder than it is. Token economies. Measure a sample of... I'm sorry, token economies proven effective in practically every setting and context. Your basic steps, identify target behaviors, select tokens, develop a menu of backup reinforcers, establish an exchange ratio, determine a reinforcement schedule and what happens if requirements are not met, and then try out the system. 
Thanks for watching. Check out bcbastudy.com for BCBA exam materials and rbtexamreview.com for RBT exam materials. We've helped thousands of RBTs and BCBAs pass their exam. You could be next. As always, work hard, study hard, and I will see you soon.